This is a sports catastrophe production. Hey there, Heather, hello there. It's Jeff Gunner Donovan welcoming you to another sports catastrophe on this day. And on this day, January 17th, 50 years ago, amazing, was one of the most iconic Super Bowls of all time. Not Super Bowl three, not Super Bowl thirteen, not even Super Bowl ten. I'm talking about Super Bowl five. Oh, not a minute. What are you talking about? Super Bowl five was shit. Who remembers Super Bowl five? Well, if it ain't Mr. Doubter. Well, Mr. Doubter, I like to say that I personally don't invite you to do these things. But yeah, you got a point. Why do people like Super Bowl five? Well, People do remember Super Bowl V, especially if you were a Baltimore Colts fan who obviously 13 years later got their heart broken when the Colts left for Indianapolis. And basically for Dallas fans, because it's like sometimes you, you forget the losses more, you remember the losses more than the wins. So anyway, Super Bowl V was huge. This was the first Super Bowl in the merger, since the merger of the AFL and the NFL. And as I said in, Super Bowl, in my Super Bowl three video, if you want to watch it, feel free to. Sports Catastrophe on this day, Super Bowl three. search for that on YouTube. Basically put, got, is that, you know, the Colts, the Steelers, and the Browns went from the NFL to the AFL slash AFC. And then everyone else went to the NFC. So it was 26 teams until Tampa and Seattle joined the party in 76. But, I digress. The Baltimore Colts won the AFC Championship, and the Dallas Cowboys won the NFC Championship. Now, here's the thing, though. In the, before the merger, the Colts would have been facing the Cowboys probably in a playoff game, and then we don't know who the AFL opponent would be. So, basically, this game was played at the Orange Bowl on January 17, 1971, 50 years ago today. The first Super Bowl game on artificial turf. Artificial turf? The Orange Bowl? Really? Well, given the fact that the Orange Bowl Stadium hosted the Miami Hurricane, the and then the Orange Bowl, and then, well, the Dolphins, and then a Super Bowl every so often, it was warranted. It was weird, Mr. Doubter, and you're right, that Super Bowl three was played on grass, whereas Super Bowl five was on poly turf. Obviously, that was the best way to try to change the logos and all that. Although, in 1982, when the Chargers faced the Dolphins in the greatest game ever played in 1981, the 80s version, basically you still saw the Orange Bowl logo at center, in the center, the center field, the 80 and the 50 yard line, and then the Orange Bowl stuff in the end zone instead of Dolphins. Right, so anyway, this was the first Super Bowl played, as I said, after the merger. Beginning this game and continuing present day, the Super Bowl is the NFL's championship game. The AFC and NFC championship would meet in the finals. All 26 AFL and NFL teams were divided into two conferences of 13 teams each. So basically, the 10 AFL teams stayed where they are, and as I said, Browns, Steelers, and Colts went to the AFC. And of course, it explains why the Colts were the NFL represented in Super Bowl III, but in Super Bowl V, they were the AFC. Baltimore was 11 2 and 1, and ties exist still to this day, of course. They were the best team in the AFC. Dallas, by proxy, were technically the third seed, third best team in the NFC and NFL. Of a 10 4 mark. The Colts, this was their second Super Bowl appearance after that debacle go in Super Bowl 3. And the Cowboys, this was their first time up. Dallas started off terrible. If you know the franchise history, 1960, they basically were crap. An expansion draft was held, but it basically had nobodies and all that. They managed a tie against the New York Giants and nothing else. But Don Landry kept building them up and up and up and up, and they lost the first two NFC championship or NFL championship games in the Super Bowl era. Not the Super Bowl itself, but the NFL kind of slash NFC. So anyway, this game is called the Blunder Bowl, the Blooper Bowl, or the Super Bowl because of poor play, a blocked point after, missed opportunities, penalties, turnovers, and bad officiating. The two teams combined for a Super Bowl record 11 turnovers with five in the fourth quarter. And that still is a Super Bowl record to this day, 50 years later. The Colts' seven turnovers are still the most committed by a Super Bowl champion, much less a team. I think the Bills, no wait, Buffalo in 93, they had nine 
turnovers. But anyway, Dallas set a Super Bowl record with 10 penalties with 133 yards. That's amazing. Jim O'Brien was the hero for the Colts. More on that later. Baltimore actually had an issue because Johnny United actually got injured in the second quarter and didn't come back and play the game. Mm. What is it about United is now finishing Super Bowls? Super Bowls. And this was the only Super Bowl in which the MVP was given to the lose, a member of the losing team, Cowboys linebacker Chuck Howley, who was weirdly the first non-quarterback to win the award. It was Bart Starr, Bart Starr, Joe Namath, and Len Dawson. But he made two picks. Sacks and tackles were not yet recorded, so basically we don't know how good he was. So the Colts were near a little two-point favorites and all of that. Joe Unitas, of course, in Super Bowl V, would be making the start, unlike Super Bowl III, when he was on the bench, when Earl Morrow was the guy who came in for United when he got injured off in the offseason of 68. Morrow went out to be NL, NFL MVP, pardon, and basically got the Colts to Super Bowl III, but he made several mistakes, including mishand not seeing Jimmy Orr wide open in the end zone. Everyone knows that. So basically, United was inconsistent. He only threw for 22, he threw for 2,200 yards, which was decent at that time, but he had more interceptions and touchdowns. He had injury problems, and Earl Morrow still was with the Colts. Thankfully, the Colts never got rid of Morrow or United. So Morrow basically was United's backup and got better stats and all that. Head coach Don McCaffrey decided to start United for the playoffs. Wait a tick. Him. It's Don Shula. Everyone knows it's Don Shula. Sadly, though, the Colts were so, Colts management was so upset, Mr. Dowder, after Super Bowl three, they decided to get rid of Don Shula, and he bolted for the Miami Dolphins. Mm. So anyway, Baltimore had some good players. The wide receivers Eddie Hinton and Roy Jefferson, with, with future Hall of Fame tight end John Mackey, doing pretty well for himself. Pro Bowl defensive tackle and close to a Hall of Famer Bubba Smith. Did well on the defense. Mike Curtis, had linebacker, a pro bowler, was great. And Ted, the Matt Stork Hendricks. Jerry Logan was a great safety alongside Rick Falk. So basically the Colts were decent. Dan Klosterman was the Colts GM and future Colts GM Ernie Corsi was the PR director. Baltimore were 11-2-1, the best in the AFC. Only the Vikings had a better record in the NFL. About all teams at 12-2. <coughs> now for the Cowboys. The Cowboys had troubles. Calvin Hill, yes, the son, the father of Grant Hill, was lost for the year because he got a leg injury late in the regular season. And Bob Bullet Hayes basically had bad performances, and Tom Landry benched him. However, the Cowboys would have a cowboy, uh, cowboy quarterback controversy. Craig Morton and Roger Staubach. And yes, Craig Morton was a Dallas Cowboy, by the way. They were... They were alternated starters during the regular season. And Landry decided to give Morton most of the starts in the latter half of the season because he wasn't confident Staubach would follow his game plan. And Landry called the place. Morton seemed to do a lot better. Morton was a thrower, Staubach was a scrambler. Bob Hayes did okay. He got 10 touchdown catches, even though he was benched a lot of time. And Lance Ransell did very well. Unfortunately, Lance Renzel was basically kicked off the team for a inducing exposure charge. However, the Cowboys offense had their running game. Dwayne Thomas, who basically was the main running back, did pretty well. Walt Garrison, who replaced Calvin Hill in the backfield, does some good blocking and all that. And they had a good guard in Rayfield Wright. The Colts had like the Colts, the Cowboys had their defense. They actually allowed one touchdown in their last six games prior to the Super Bowl, which is amazing. Bob Lilly, Leroy Jordan, Chuck Howley, Mal Renfro, Herb Adderley, Cliff Harris, and Charlie Waters were good defensive players. Dallas was 10-4 and in the NFC East. They actually won their last five games to beat the St. Louis Cardinals. Yes, the Cardinals were in St. Louis at one time as a football team. And the New York Giants. If the Giants ended up beating the Rams on the final day of the season, then the Cowboys would have had a coin flip with Detroit for the wild card spot. But Detroit ended up being the wild card. And in those days, 
those days. One versus four, two versus three. So the best team in the NFL took on the wild card team, and second would take on third. However, because Dallas and Detroit, I believe, ended up no, because I think Detroit and Minnesota, yeah, Detroit and Minnesota ended up on different sides of the ledger. The rule, the rule at the time was that the wild card team couldn't face the top team in their conference if they were in the same division. That's why the Cowboys ended up playing Detroit, whereas San Fran would have to take on Minnesota. In the playoffs, the Colts shut out the Cincinnati Bengals 17 0. What were the Bengals doing in the Super Bowl? I don't know. Super Bowl playoffs. The Cowboys would face the Lions that same day in the wild card round, and Dallas would win by a score of 5 to nil. Like, what? It is the lowest scoring postseason game in NFL history, which is amazing. To this day, 50 years later. Wow. Hard to believe, eh? Hard to believe. So that was December 26, 1970. And then the next week in the AFC title game, Baltimore hosted Oakland and beat old man George Blanda. And all that. The Cowboys would take on the Niners in San Francisco and beat them. It's weird how San Francisco was decent and all that. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, Super Bowls. Five came along. And the Colts were hoping to redeem themselves for Super Bowl three. And the Cowboys wanted to lose their nickname of next year's champions and lose the rule as chokers because they had a chance to go to the first two Super Bowls, but Green Bay beat them both twice. Dallas decided to wear had to wear their blue jerseys for being the home team. And Dallas hadn't worn its blue jerseys at home since nineteen sixty three. The Cowboys wore their blue jerseys twice and were one and one. But the designated home team was the first allowed its choice of jersey color at Super Bowl 13. Colts were two and a half point favorites, which isn't that bad. Spiro Agnew actually attended the game at the PP, but he was a Colts fan because he came from the Baltimore area and he was governor of Maryland. Ali was in attendance. Nixon had a vacation home near the Orange Bowl. So this game kicked off at 2 o'clock Eastern Time. And only one of only three Super Bowls to start in the morning for Fears in the Pacific Zone. So Super Bowl 6 and Super Bowl 10. So basically, it's always been a, from Super Bowl 11 on, it was always at least noon Eastern Time and Pacific Time when the Super Bowl happened. NBC got to broadcast this one. Kurt Gowdy and Kyle Root were the big guys. Of course, blackout rules ruined Miami fans' chances to watch the game on TV and all that. Alaska got a chance to host the Super Bowl. Great. So basically, there's been a lot of problems with the game and all that. The video of the complete original broadcast up until Chuck Kelly's second interception which is the first play of the fourth quarter exists. But the rest of the fourth quarter got missing from the Nebrick Vaults. The complete audio does exist. Broadcast excerpts from the crucial fourth quarter plays, which actually were recovered from the Canadian feed of NBC's original um, broadcast circulate around collectors. So, so, of course, Canada, CBC had the Super Bowl, and basically they would... Um, Give the feed, get the American feed, but put the Canadian commercials in. Kind of like what we do now with CTV. So, anyway, 46 million people watched the game on TV. Now, remember, this is 1971. So, basically, there was supposed to be a planned flyby, but it didn't happen. Well, it happened five minutes after the national anthem. So, basically, there was a lot of issues and all that. As I said, 11 turnovers. I'm not going to bore you with all the turnovers. But the game was tied 13-13. Jim O'Brien, the rookie kicker, kicked the 32-yard field goal and got it through the post. And the Baltimore Colts 
got the redemption for losing Super Bowl three. Good thing for Earl Morrow coming in after Unitas' injury because he was actually better than Unitas. Morrow was. Poor Unitas. Bubba Smith actually refuses to wear his Super Bowl ring because of the sloppy play and all that. And Chuck Cowley refused the MVP award because it was meaningless, because he lost. And he's the only player on a losing team to lose to get that. Don McCaffrey was actually named the first rookie head coach to win a Super Bowl. And it didn't happen until George Seifert in Super Bowl 24. People thought Bill Walsh led them to the Super Bowl in 1990, but no. It was actually um, George Seifert. And McCaffrey was actually the first Super Bowl coach to not wear a coat and tie, opting for a short sleeve t-shirt with a mock turtleneck. Kind of weird. Okay. And the funny thing is that there were a couple of rule changes before 1974, but when the defensive team commits an illegal hand, use of hands, arms, or body foul, the penalty will be assessed from the previous spot instead of the spot of the foul. And the penalties for offensive holding were down from 15 to 10 yards. And Dallas had two offensive holding penalties that ruined them. They would have been given 10 yards instead of 15, so their penalty yards would have been down 10 yards. So Dallas had a 6 0 lead with a pair of field goals by Mike Clark. Baltimore got a touchdown catch from Uni from John Mackey from Unitas, but the kick from a right point after was blocked. Dwayne Thomas got a touchdown from Craig Morton to make it 13 6 Dallas. Tom Nowatsky tied it with a touchdown run and then Jim O'Brien's field goal. So, strange it, it just sucked all that. A lot of things, a lot of records were set, but of course they've been broken ever since. So, yeah, the Super Bowl was one heck of a ride. Sloppy, but it was a heck of a ride. Unfortunately for Baltimore Colts fans, this would be the high point of their fandom as they kept making appearances in the 70s in the playoffs, but kept choking, especially at home. They got crushed by Pittsburgh one year, and that was the year that a fan actually crashed his small plane into the upper deck of the stadium. Thankfully, fans left the stadium in disgust after the blowout, so no fans were hurt, except for the pilot. And then you got yourself the next year losing to the Ghost of the Post play by the Oakland Raiders in double overtime. Of course, the Colts would move to Indianapolis in 1984, and that would be that for Baltimore football until 1996, when the Ravens moved from Cleveland. The Cleveland Browns became the Baltimore Ravens. Cleveland was given an expansion team and all the records. And CFL football returned to Montreal inadvertently because Baltimore had no need for a CFL team. And Montreal got the franchise, and they've been a powerhouse ever since. Dallas would recover and win Super Bowl VI, 24-3, against the Miami Dolphins. And they've won a few more along the way. Good news for Cowboys fans. Hello, I'm Jeff Diamond. I do.